Hello and welcome to this evening's event titled Museums, the Artist Creation. My name is Sandra Sikorova, and it's very dark in here suddenly. <laughs> Can we? <laughs> and I'm the curator of public programs here, and it's my great pleasure to introduce the first event in the this year's BMW Tate Live Talk series, which complements and critically examines key issues and questions arising from the BMW Tate Live 2015 program here at Tate Modern. Last year, across four public discussions, we explored notions of liveness, publicness, temporality, and the politics of creating live performance in relation to an audience. This year, we are back to continue these exciting public debates, provoked by the latest developments in live art and performance today. As Tate Modern prepares to be transformed into Musée de la Danse by the choreographer and dancer Boris Sharmatz in only three days' time, the event is an opportunity to celebrate and critically investigate this phenomena of artists creating their own museums. We're joined by three practitioners, or as they'd like to call themselves, museum directors, who will offer very different perspectives on the subject this evening. We hope that this evening will shed some light on the following questions, including what are the diverse motivations behind artists setting up their own real and fictitious museums across the globe? What are the possibilities and challenges that museums as artwork pose? And what is the role in relation to established museums of art and the wider social, cultural, and political realms in which these operate? Our chair this evening is Grant Watson. Grant is a curator, researcher, and tutor in curatorial theory at the Royal College of Art in London. Recent exhibitions that he's curated include How We Behave, presented at Nottingham Contemporary and soon at the showroom in London in June, Social Fabric at Ineva, Lunds Kunsthal, and Dr. Bao Da Art Museum in Mumbai, Keywords, Art, Culture, and Society in 1980s Britain at Tate Liverpool, and the touring retrospective of Sheila Gauda, Open Eye Policy at the Van Abe Museum, Lunds Kunsthal, and Irish Museum of Modern Art. Since the late 1980s, Grant has also worked with modern and contemporary art from India. 90s. Since the late 1990s, Grant has also worked with modern and contemporary art from India. Thank you for the correction. He has been the senior curator at the Institute of International Visual Arts, London, and prior to that, curator at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Antwerp and curator of visual art at Project in Dublin. Before I hand over to Grant to introduce this evening's speakers, a few words about the format. We'll start with each speaker presenting for about 20 minutes after which we'll have a panel discussion and Q&A. Uh, as you might have noticed, we're filming this event, so can I ask you to please set your phones to a silent mode, if possible, and wait for the microphone to ask your questions. Thank you. And finally, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank BMW, who are sponsoring this series and who help us make these events possible. So thank you, BMW. And now please join me in welcoming our chair of this evening, Grant Watson. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sandra, and thank you very much for inviting me to chair this talk tonight. I'm really delighted to be uh, able to have this conversation with such, three such interesting uh, practices in relation to um, artists making museums. And when you invited me to do the talk, to chair the talk, the first thing I thought of was this uh, seminal book. Um, that was edited by A.A. Bronson and Peggy Gale. Um, A.A. Bronson is an artist who is in general idea, and Peggy Gale is a curator and art historian, <clears throat> and it's called Museums, Museums by Artists. And in the, in the uh, sort of introduction to the book, A.A. makes this kind of very short aphoristic statement where he says that, you know, the whole, despite the whole kind of edifice and complexity of the museum, that really it's just a kind of frame for this urge to collect that, that is there in, in, in society and culture. Um, and he also says that, you know, the museum can be a medium. It can become a medium, very interesting medium for artists. Um, and Peggy Gale, in her <coughs> extended 
sort of introduction sort of develops this and says that, you know, that artists actually, there are sort of roughly three categories that she breaks this down into, the way that artists use the museum as a medium. Um, so one of these is the museum as a format, the way that artists will, <clears throat> you know, use the term museum and structure um, ideas, um, concepts, um, in particular ways of working, performative actions, gestures, and so forth, within that notion of a museum format. Um, the other one is the, the collection. So artists also often have the desire to collect. Sometimes this is from you know, personal interest. At other times, it is uh, because <clears throat> they want to engage with materials that might not belong or uh, have a place in a, a, a traditional museum collection. And then the third one she mentions is a sort of interest and reflection by artists on museum practice and museum history and ideology, which is, co of course, something which uh, came to the fore in institutional critique. So the way that artists actually spoke back to the museum um, in terms of how it functions as an institution in relation to society. Um, so <clears throat> the thing that also is, I think, very useful about this book, it's a very rare book, it's very hard to get hold of. The Tate have a copy of it, but it's out. Um, there's an, also a sort of nice short list of uh, historical examples, which I think are also interesting to mention as a way of giving a context to the practices that are going to be presented tonight. Um, so Peggy Gale mentions uh, Lizitsky's um, demonstration rooms in the 1920s, where Lizitsky was really interested in encouraging the viewer, the audience, to enter into a space where the relationship with the material on display was haptic and tactile rather than visual, rather than purely visual. Um, the very famous example of Duchamp's uh, Le Boite de Valise from 1941, where he made a, a sort of portable um, a monograph of his own, his own oeuvre. Um, and, of course, Brother's Museum of Modern Art, Department of Eagles, which he described as being a lie and a deceit, a kind of deceitful display. Um, and then a very uh, camp but conceptual project from General Idea from the 1970s called the Miss General Idea Pavilion, which was a conceptual trope that the group used in order to critique and thematize the art world, but also as a way to kind of enter the art world on their own terms. So I think just a few framing questions from that um, that I hope that will come up later in our discussion. So one I think is the idea of autonomy, um, the way that artists claim the format of the museum in order to take some kind of control, not only over the production of their work, but also over its collection, display, and mediation. Um, museum is methodology, so I think often there's a process by which artists kind of smuggle material through the protocols of the museum and give it some kind of authoritative status. Um, and I think that also still, <clears throat> notwithstanding the fact that um, institutional critique in many ways has been institutionalized and brought inside the museum walls, there's still, I think, a space in which artists are fascinated, um, sometimes critical, engaged with the museum as an institution still, um, often in a very, very fondly, sometimes in a very angry way, um, and how questions of power and influence within collections and museum practices persist. So um, th these, I think these themes are going to be explored through the work of the artists, and I'll just introduce them now briefly. Um, the reason why we're having this discussion tonight is in relation to a project which will be taking place at Tate Modern on Friday and Saturday, which is called If Tate Modern Was Musée de la Danse, which is by Boris Charmitz, who's a dancer and choreographer and also director of the Musée de la Danse, um, which he uh, <clears throat> became director in, in 2009, I think, and changed the name and changed the kind of function of the museum and started to think about the museum as a kind of conceptual space. Um, so on top of its practical function, it also would become an embodied, provocative, transgressive, um, and permeable space. And these are terms that are written in the manifesto that was um, produced at the time of, of this change of name. And uh, over 48 hours, the uh, Musée de la Danse will inhabit the spaces of Tate Modern um, 
and I think sort of bring out the kind of choreographic aspect of the museum, as well as juxtapose the ephemeral and transient element of dance into the collections and engage in a discussion about what, what a museum of dance could be. Um, then we have Dianita Singh, who's an artist, I'm sorry, a museum director, and a bookmaker who works in photography. So Dianita says that her, her role and her title change in the, on each occasion, but tonight she's here as a museum director of the Museum Bhavan in Delhi. Um, so just to sort of preface that, Dianita <clears throat> works, has worked extensively with publications as a way of bringing together her photography projects. Um, but recently has opened a project called the Museum Bhavan in Delhi, um, which is a series of structures that she has designed and produced in order to um, both uh, store and display her work. And I think that what's very important in this, this project is the, the idea of the audience and the kind of relate, direct relationship that the artist can produce with an audience through this notion of the museum. Um, the museum is also portable, so it's, I think, traveling or potentially. It was here in, in London, in fact, at the Hayward Gallery recently. Um, and then Simon Fujiwara is an artist who <clears throat> um, has a background also in architecture. So architecture features uh, quite strongly in his work and um, will appear in his uh, lecture, his performative lecture tonight, which is about the, in the Museum of Incest, which must be the only museum of that, of that name in the world. I would say. Um, but Simon, Simon also, maybe some of you saw an installation that he made recently at the Hayward, I think it closed a week or two ago, which was a display that explored the notion of Britishness in the last 10 years. And it was a collection of both artworks and objects. So Simon was both, I think, the, the curator of that uh, display, but also the designer of the the uh, exhibition structures that the works were shown on. Um, and Simon has also worked, I think, quite extensively with the notion of the museum. And in our conversation, I hope we can also go through some of those projects. So without further ado, I would like to invite Simon to come and talk about his Museum of Incest. The Museum of Incest is essentially an architectural project <clears throat> that I developed after um, a journey that I made to the east of Africa, to uh, the Olduvai Gorge, which is um, adjacent to the Serengeti Plains, um, sort of between Kenya and Tanzania. Um, the site is an important archaeological site, um, mainly because of the discovery of what Lewis Leakey, the archaeologist in the 1960s, described as the first, um, as first man, the discovery of the first human being who ever walked the earth, Homo habilis, Latin for handyman. Um, and um, I was interested in going to visit this a specific site because Homo habilis was in fact described as the father of civilization. And um, on a personal level, my relationship with my father has been very distant throughout my whole life. And I was interested in this notion of going back perhaps to an ur father to discover what a father of civilization might be and to retrace um, the steps on, on a more historical level. This is the um, site where the body was discovered. It was scattered um, quite widely in three parts um, across the Olduvai Gorge. Most of the journey was made um, over, um, over land by car. Um, and when the terrain got too rough, of course, we descended and went by foot. This first slide um, shows the excavation um, where large parts of the lower um, anatomy was discovered. Um, the second, where the upper body was scattered with a modest concrete memorial here. And the last um, and most elaborate of the memorials for Homo habilis um, is this one, which is in fact where the skull um, of the remains was discovered by Lewis Leakey. How was it that Lewis Leakey was able to describe this as the first human being when, of course, when we look at his skull, there are many traits that look perhaps more like our ape ancestors than our human um, 
ancestors or human um, kind, the raised protruding cranium, the deep sunken eyes and the, and the high cheekbones, um, all led a number of archaeologists to wonder how it was possible that he could really claim this was um, a, a human being. And indeed, it wasn't the actual physiognomy of the discoveries, but it was in fact the objects that were discovered around the body, and that was a series of stone tools or flints. Uh, Lewis Leakey claimed that this was the first body discovered with stone tools around it, meaning that this was the first um, organism that was using um, tools to manipulate the world, to kill, to hunt, to create fire perhaps. And of course, by using tools, this, um, this being would have to walk at least partially upright. Um, and so it was based on this evidence that he claimed that this um, that the, the Homo habilis, the handyman, was the first human being. It was curious to me to think about this flint, uh, this, this tool, as, as the, first, um, the first creation of, of humankind, as the first tool, because, of course, it was a, an object was, that was used to kill. Um, and in essence, in an essential idea, we could say it's the first weapon, that the first tool that, that humans made was also a weapon. And this kind of time conundrum to think about um, the first possibility of, of creating, of killing, of, of manipulating the world um, was also a kind of very early harbinger of a weapon, as we could say, of mass destruction, that the beginning of time, of human time, and the end of human time could somehow be knitted together in this one um, one artifact, and incidentally, when we look at the time that the f that first man, Homo habilis, was discovered, um, 1964, within five years, first man, uh, the f the first man was put on the moon, and so we have this period in the 60s when the super past and the super future, the possibility of taking humankind off a planet that is perhaps ravaged by its own destruction, um, could exist in the same this same five year period. When I returned um, from Africa, I started to look through some of the newspaper articles that were written at the time of the discovery. And there was a general kind of uproar uh, and um, various extreme reactions, especially from the Catholic Church, that of course didn't like the fact that there was indeed proof of what Lewis Leakey would claim is evolution, um, that we are actually based on animal ancestors, and worse still, that our Ur mensch, our, our ancestors were African, um, which was very displeasing to certain Central European authorities. But it wasn't until I discovered this article, Man's Dread of Incest, A Deeply Rooted Feeling, that I understood, in fact, what it was that I was unearthing here, or what it was that I was discovering on this site. That in fact, and this article rather eloquently points out, and I'll save you from reading it entirely, that um, if, according to the scientists who discovered this, 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 uh, this body, we all do descend from this one familial structure, how is it possible that we've, we've grown to this population we are today without ever having performed incest? And this article argues that we are the, the, the whole of humankind is in fact a product of incest, however pure we may think our bloodlines and our ancestry. Um, it's a rather wild and fleeting thought, but one that I thought perhaps um, could be formalized into a history which has never been written before. Um, as far as my knowledge, um, at the moment when I started to think about this, there was no museum of incest in existence, and I started to think what would the artifact be within a museum um, that would represent this history, which of course throughout the whole of time has been a taboo. Um, are there, in fact, any artifacts, indeed, to represent in this? Um, and therefore, the challenge would be, how would one create a museum for a history that has no history? Um, the first thing, of course, um, I knew would be necessary for the success of the museum would be an iconic form. And so I started to look at the various um, most successful museum buildings of the 90s and early 2000s and to try to understand the relationship between, of course, um, local regeneration, um, a, a healthy economy, of course, uh, a collection and a, a, a lively program of public events, and of course, a form of the building creating some kind of um, international impact. But of course, forms don't just appear from nowhere, and I needed to look back at the um, original site to see if I could find anything in the geology or the geography that would help me understand what form this museum should take. 
Interestingly, the three graves were scattered in an almost perfect equilateral triangle, um, which led me to an object that had been sitting um, rather um, blind to me for, for a number of years on my desk, which was this um, strange um, invention by my father, in fact, who is an architect and an inventor of sorts. And this is a, um, a, a prototype for an experimental goldfish bowl, um, which was created to test the physical, um, the spatial and architectural psychology of fish to in some form transcend the human and the animal world um, or the aquatic world um, through architecture. And what he did was he would place um, three different kind of scenes. One would be a desert scene, perhaps with just sand, one a kind of mini medieval castle, and one with kind of green seaweed, and see where the three fish um, would swim to um, most. The um, experiments were somewhat thwarted by the fact that, of course, it's never possible to know if fish, in fact, have any kind of memory, whether they even know where they are um, or if they prefer it to the last place they had been. But um, this form or this structure seemed somehow perfect for the Museum of Incest, to house the Museum of Incest because it could fit um, with one foot um, each on the site of the three graves, so literally standing on the foundations, on, on the graves of first man, um, and not only that, but the sort of futuristic, or, or what we would in the 60s perhaps imagine as a futuristic form, would sit anachronistically within the ancient African landscape. Now I'm going to just take you on a very brief um, and, and quite condensed tour of, of, the, of the three main spaces of the museum um, and um, talk about some of the ways in which the collections are played out. Um, the museum is ar arranged in reverse order, so we as we enter, we enter into the, the modern era before going to the Middle Ages and finally to the ancient world, um, which seemed to be a quite um, a, a simple and logical way to, to arrange these three periods of, of, of the ways in which these taboos had played out. And so we start with the modern era. Um, and the modern era, we could say, is defined as a time in which judicial uh, practices, in which law making um, and, and, and the state um, have um, play into the, um, the way in which sexual practices are governed. Um, and um, for this reason, I thought the model of the interior of the, um, the courts, the International Courts of Human Rights, um, would be the perfect reconstruction for this space. Again, a circular space. Um, here representing democracy um, in the way we understand it as a mid-20th century idea. idea. Um, and within this space, um, there would be, um, in, within this reconstruction, there would be daily performances, um, of course everything ephemeral then, daily performances in which current incest cases taking place around the world, or more recent incest cases, could be restaged, such as, for example, the recent case of the brother and sister Stubling um, from Thuringen in central Germany, um, a German locksmith and his um, sibling and partner who have um, four children and are currently battling um, a long case um, in the Court of Human Rights as we speak. Um, as part of the museum's um, commitment to local regeneration, um, all of the actors will be played by local um, native peoples. And um, this, of course, poses some, of course, political um, issues and, and questions are, are raised. But um, f at, within the Museum of Incest, we believe that it's important that there is a kind of racial blurring when it comes to how certain figures are portrayed and that no one race is um, stigmatized or is um, having to take on the complete incest narrative. And so things are, um, are blurred in that sense. Taking you now to the Middle Ages, the Middle Ages is um, a time when we could say that, um, that the Bible and the church as an institution um, was having a strong grip on the ways in which sexual practices um, were, were, um, it, it had an effect on sexual practices. And um, in this section, I thought that um, a reconstruction from a biblical scene would be the most appropriate way of discussing this. And so we have a reconstruction of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities that were, of course, destroyed after um, an incestuous story and uh, a number of other things, which, of course, you know the story and I don't have time to go into here. Um, 
the reconstruction is based on three images from different periods in history and is within, even in its construction, completely um, anachronistic. So it is at once um, f theater flats and at another time a kind of romantic blazing city. And again, of course, as part of our commitment, um, not only to um, local economy, but to ecology, the entire section is made with local um, mud brick material techniques. Finally, we come to the last room, which is the oldest part of the museum, and that is the ancient world. And the ancient world is represented in the form of a paradisical um, lettuce garden. This kind of image of a garden or of paradise may seem somewhat, um, um, somewhat out of character for, for, for an idea that um, has been taboo for so long and has seen, of course, um, uh, has seen a, a number of um, detractors and, and, and possible obstacles to become a, an official history. Um, but the form of the lettuce was chosen because um, in a number of ancient Egyptian mythologies, the lettuce appears as an aphrodisiac. A number of Egyptian mythologies, of course, often um, depicting or describing um, an incestuous couplings, um, fathers, mothers, gods, all um, copulating. And the reason why the lettuce, um, which to many of us will seem like a rather sad, um, wilting and, and perhaps unsexy um, vegetable was chosen as an aphrodisiac was because of um, a milky white substance that secretes from some forms of lettuce, which is called lactuca. Um, and this, um, interestingly, this milky white substance has the molecular structure of a tripartite molecule, um, which again reflects the entire structure of the whole museum. So that from the very cells growing within the microbiology growing within the museum to the whole structure, the iconic structure of the form, we have this tripartite, um, this tripartite molecular bond um, forming all the way through. Egypt was a kind of heyday for incest. It was, in fact, the only period um, that I can describe that, um, in which incest practices were not only tolerated but were actually um, formally, essentially, written into the, um, the hierarchical um, le legal structure of the um, Egyptian state. And this was because um, Egypt was a matriarchal society, meaning that the mothers held all the power, officially. So that when a mother would die, a father could essentially be left without a home. He could be cast out onto the street. Um, but, um, of course, there were ways around this. And what would often happen would be that if, if a, the matriarch of the family would die, the, uh, the father would, in fact, marry the eldest daughter to stay within the family and to keep the continuity of the bloodline. Um, and so in this way, incest was a kind of very accepted and, and regulated part of Egyptian society to the point that we see even in Egyptian language the words for mother and wife, father and husband and sister brother or lover are completely interchangeable so that it's with great difficulty that contemporary hieroglyphic um, archaeologists um, can understand who is in fact talking about who in the ancient world. I'm going to take you to the very last um, part of the museum now, and perhaps the most important part, um, certainly of this museum, but increasingly of museums around the world, and that is um, the recreational area or the museum cafe. Um, the museum cafe is housed at the base of a 46 meter deep inverted um, glazed pyramid. <laughs> the, um, the pyramid structure was selected, of course, as it resonates with the formerly seen Egyptian room, um, but also because um, the pyramid is, of course, a symbol of 2,000 years of Western civilization, and by its inversion and some, perhaps some could say dematerialization through glass, it has a kind of satanic or, a, or, a, or, a, um, um, or an um, appropriately um, taboo-laden um, form. But not only symbolically is the um, glazing in the pyramid important, but it, of course, gives the visitor a view um, of the archaeological layers, the stratification, which is fascinating at the Olduvai Gorge, so that the visitor not only metaphorically but can physically pass through the layers of time as they descend through the bowels of the museum. Of course, the issue is how to bring visitors safely down um, a 46 meter glazed structure. And this is perhaps um, quite elegantly um, um, resolved by the architects with a continuously sloping ramp, which um, 
forms um, uh, not only a, an opportunity to display um, pictures, it's the only um, space with walls, albeit that, albeit that they're curved and on a ramp, which poses problems for the curators, of course, um, but, um, but is, of course, at its, um, at its minor gradient, is wheelchair access friendly. I'm just going to talk about two of the works in this section. Um, there are many, many other paintings that could be described, but they are reconstructions of paintings, other famous paintings in history. Um, one borrowed or, or repainted from the Louvre, perhaps the most explicitly incestuous work um, that we know, an oil painting from the 18th century, Gabrielle Destress and her sister. Um, here we see two sisters in the bath, one, of course, tweaking the nipple of the other, the blonde here holding um, a, a ring, um, of course, a, 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 a metaphor or a symbol of, the, of female anatomy, rather suggestively towards the picture plane, whilst her mother comfortably um, knits or crochets in the background <laughs> um, next to um, a hearth um, with a kind of cropped sort of male figure in the background. The hearth, of course, the symbol, the central symbol of, of, of family and unity. Um, this being one of the more modern works um, in the collection. The, the oldest work um, at the bottom, as, as, as we get closer to the rock, um, in fact painted directly onto the rock, a remake of the cave paintings from Lascaux. Um, and this one, particularly this interesting detail, depicts a man perhaps wearing um, an animal head, perhaps a, a, as, a, as a mask or, having, or a, a real animal head. Perhaps his head has become an animal, we don't know. But he has speared this bison in an act of, of war, um, or in an act of destruction or, or, or of hunger. Um, and as the bowels of the bison spill um, sensually and erotically onto the ground, we see that this human figure has gained an erection um, that mimics the spearing, um, the spearing action um, almost perfectly. And this image, of course, whilst not directly incestuous, um, brings together a lot of the themes of the, of the um, bridging of animal and human worlds, of, of, um, of masquerade, of eroticism, history, death and weaponry, all coming together in this wonderful image, which many describe as the first work of art. Finally, um, in the last minute we have here, um, we come to the Museum Cafe. And the Museum Cafe is decorated with a large mural depicting um, a sort of idealized um, Mediterranean looking family scene. Um, again, the hearth appears as an image. And this um, image is, in fact, a mural painted, again, by my father for one of his architectural projects for the design of an Italian restaurant in the town of Shizuoka in Japan. Um, my father, after not having seen him for six or seven years, sent me an envelope with images of this mural in it, um, with, with no description at all, just photographs. And I wondered why he was sending me this, whether it was a, a wrong address or he was trying to send it to, to a client to, to show what kind of murals he can make. Um, but I started looking, and, the, and it not only were the series of photographs in this envelope, but there were also a series of Polaroids. And when I started to match and compare, I noticed that my father had, in fact, photographed himself um, posing within the scene and then painted himself um, as the ideal father, rather ironic if you think about the reality of the situation. Um, but not only had he done this, this transversal of, of the political, of, of time, of history, of the, of the reality of our relationship, um, and tried to solidify it in this artwork, he also has changed his race to an Italian man um, to fit perhaps more congenially within this, this image, this fantasy that he'd created. And of course, looking further, I realized the real point of why he'd sent me this, which is the fact that the little boy um, was a portrait of me. Again, slightly warped, slightly more Western looking. And um, rather than a, a sentimental um, moment in the museum, the importance of this image is, of course, that, um, that to depict the architect of the museum um, would be the ultimate um, architect's sort of iconic signature on the building and the end of the tour of the Museum of Incest. Thank you. Thank you. I'm here as the director of Museum Bhavan and I bring you greetings from the trustees and advisors 
um, of Museum Bhavan. This is Museum Bhavan just returned to my apartment in New Delhi. It was always built to be in this apartment. And the museum has slip covers when I don't want to look at it too much. Then if you book an appointment, I might open one of them for you to see. Museum Bhavan is a collection of seven plus two museums made by Dayanita Singh, permanently installed at Vasant Vihar, New Delhi. The museums will, however, travel to other venues. After their inaugural tour, they will be open to the public on the first and second full moon of each year. At other times, they may be viewed by appointment only or through a large window that lets people look into the bhavan without entering it. That's from one of the museums that I had photographed. I have been photographing museums for more than two decades now. Dear Hans Ulrich, dear Sunil Khilnani, dear Gautam Thapar, I write to ask if you would consider being part of the Museum Bhavan Board. The Museum Bhavan is being formally launched at the Hayward Gallery on 7th October. I was wondering if we could have our first meeting at 7.45 p.m. behind Museum of Chance and in front of Museum of Furniture. We need to decide whether to announce the Archivist in Residence program as well as the publication program with Steidl, or to wait to do this when Museum Bhavan returns to India and we have our first Nano Museum seminar. Look forward to our meeting, Dayanita Singh, Secretary Museum Bhavan, 3rd of October 2013. Now I'm the director. I keep changing my positions as and when I feel like it's my museum. This is Museum of Chance at the Hayward Gallery, curated by Stephanie Rosenthal, and actually hastened and really processed uh, because of Stephanie. I will come to that. So this is Museum of Chance, which is these two structures um, that you could walk through with a lot of discussion on wheelchair access, and it had to be a meter apart. Um, and on this side is the Museum of Little Ladies. These are large wooden structures, as you can see, that allow me to change the structure as well as the image inside. It was very important for me, I think, having worked with many curators in many exhibitions, to find, um, to find as Grant was saying, my autonomy of being able to decide how often I would want to change a work within the exhibition to change the actual structure, as well as to change the images within the structures, and maybe to combine some of the museums as well. Here I have File Museum and the Museum of Little Ladies. The reason the prints are the same size is because I see them as related and as cousins. The museums have cousins and the museums have children. They produce other museums. Little Ladies and File Museum are cousins and interchangeable. The museums hold within them old and new images made by Dayanita Singh. These images are endlessly displayed, sequenced, edited, and archived in the museums by the artist herself. The design and architecture of the museums are integral to the images shown and kept in them. Each large wooden handmade structure can be placed and opened in different ways. It holds around 100 framed images, some on view, while others wait for their turn in the reserve collection, also kept inside the structures. All the museums have smaller structures within them, which can be displayed inside the museum or on the wall. So the idea is that you can twist that wooden rod and pull out those three images and change them from something either that is in another museum or is in one of the boxes in storage within the museum. The museums had to be portable so that I could move them in and out of my apartment, but also within my apartment, that I could close them. And on the wall at the back, you see the little structures 
that come out of the museums, and you see it also in the Museum of Machines. The museums also have their own furniture, their own tables and stools for reading, and ultimately to form conversation chambers. I'm going to go through the details of the museums in a little while, but till then, I thought I would just, in the center is Museum of Furniture. And while we were installing, Museum of Furniture gave way to the museum that is on the far wall, the Museum of Vitrines. And that's what I meant by the museums being able to grow, that nothing was set in stone. That was something I really hated about all the exhibitions that I did. A, there was a photograph, then it went behind glass, then it went on the wall, and then for two months or three months, as long as the show was up, it couldn't be changed. And I would always be terribly uh, disappointed with that and sometimes would secretly go and change photos in a museum and then I would get stopped. But I couldn't bear the fact that I couldn't make changes within the exhibition to the structure, to my images, um, and I had to find a way out of that dilemma. So the museum, the museum bhavan came for a variety of different reasons, some of which I'll go through in the explanations. But I really wanted something that was portable, that was mobile, that wouldn't be specific to a certain location, that I could keep changing it, and that would, it would allow for chance, that it would allow for new things to enter, that it would not be set in so stone, that it could keep enlarging so that even if you hosted a museum of mine here, I should be allowed within two weeks to bring a little structure to add to it, and in another two months, another structure. This becomes a problem if somebody wants to collect the museum, because I would like them to collect the future of the museum, and that, I think, collectors find problematic. I also wanted to be able to, that the museums are, of course, cousins, but they are also they give birth to other museums like the vitrines, like the Museum of Embraces, which you saw on the wall before, but also one that is developing and I will talk about, which is the Museum of Gestures. Um, the key to making the museums for me is really the editing. It's not making the images, but it's getting a note in my head. And I have an idea that I have photographed these halls these cinema halls with similar kind of chairs, but they have numbers, but they had some people, and then I'll go back into my archive. But it always starts in the present, and then I go back into the archive and start finding whatever it is that I have got interested in. And then when it comes to the editing, that is really the key part, because I want the museums to be such that they can be within this collection of file museum that you could look at the, you could change the museum every day if you liked. File Museum is a very good example. It's 140 images, 40 images are displayed, and 100 images are in the display collection. So that a curator could rearrange the museum every day, every hour, as often as they liked. You open one side of the museum and it becomes this corner, and the other side and it becomes a wall and at the back is where you store, have your reserve collection. I think a lot of this museum thinking also came from the years that I was obsessed with photographing archives and libraries in India. And I found in every archive, there's, because there was no IKEA, there was no one way of making an archive, that every archivist would call the carpenter and say, here are the papers, here is the room, let's try and fit it all in. But I should be able to add, I should be able to change. And somehow that kind of immersion for two, three years into this world of archives and every archive that I could get into, I think really informed how I was going to proceed with the work that I was doing, where I was feeling a little exhausted with the print again, print with glass on the wall. And I was really only in, completely ecstatic when a book arrived from Steidl. I think at heart I was really a bookmaker. And now I see, when I see the museums lined up, that it's really, they are like giant books, except with a, the sequence can keep changing. So this is the Little Ladies Museum. So the File Museum was all the archives that I photographed for uh, 
three years concentratedly, but of course had found that they were there in my archive for a very long time. Little Ladies Museum, 1961 to present, is a compilation of my mother's photographs of me as a little lady and all the little girls that I photographed. And within that, when you look closely, you would start to see how I say that File Museum and the Little Ladies Museum are cousins. And then, of course, Museum of Chance, which you saw opened up, which is really these two pillars that open. Uh, they have about 100 images, and some of them are rectangles, some are square. But again, the editing has been done in such a way that the curator could rearrange them in any way, and I would be, I would be fine with that, because I edit with a certain tone in my head. It's an audio tone, and I just know when it works and when I have an off note. And sometimes there will be off notes because I want that off note in that symphony that I'm trying to build up. While making Museum of Chance, I realized that I was gesturing towards a museum of gestures. And so there will be, in time to come, a museum of gestures that will come out of the Museum of Chance. But what did come out during the Hayward show uh, was the Museum of Embraces. These were all the little boxes with reserve collections that were inside the Museum of Chance. And each box, I don't have a detail of it, has three images inside it. So within the box also, if you must put it on the wall, you can keep changing the images. The museums sometimes form small chambers with their own tables and benches for reflection and conversation. They can also be joined to one another to form a labyrinth, as Singh keeps adding images to the museums, the museum themselves could give birth to other museums. For example, the Museum of Embraces came out of the Museum of Chance, which I just told you, and the Museum of Vitrines is contained within the Museum of Furniture. So that was the Museum of Furniture. And literally, while we were installing it, I realized that I had a Museum of Vitrines within the Museum of Furniture. And so I had the little boxes that went on the wall and suddenly instead of seven museums, we had seven plus two museums. There's a Museum of Machines, which actually became a museum of industrial kitchens. And this too can open in different ways. They all can and you can keep changing the images. Museum of Men, recent. Now this is one that I would really like to be an ongoing project where I could delete and add men as and when I felt like. <laughs> and not have a museum director or curator tell me, but you said there were 75 men and now you have 79. <laughs> it's, it's been very, very freeing for me to become a uh, museum director of my own works and to have tremendous support from a few key people, and that's all that it takes. Museum of Photography brings me to a subject that I can never decide whether I want to talk about or not talk about, which is the idea of these nationality-based shows and nationality-based pavilions, and we had our run of the India shows, and thank God that that's over, and I think it went to Brazil, and now I don't know where it is. But I always said to people when they wanted to do shows, especially of Indian photography, that if you, you know, there's, it's, it's not like, it's, I, I don't think there's any one form for Indian photography, but if there's something special, something significant to photography in India, it's how we live with the image. It's not the images one makes, but it's how one lives with them. And the idea was always, well, nobody took that up, and I thought the real history of Indian photography is in the family album. That too didn't happen. So I think the rejections have gone a long way in my life, and I said, okay, fine, nobody wants to make uh, a museum of photography, I'll make my own museum of photography. So this is it, this is museum of photography, and this will definitely make a very substantial book, and I will see which historian I will ask to write for it. Um, and this is a museum about how we live with photography. Again, one that has to keep increasing. I can't, I can't say this is it. And the museums also have their keepers. I forgot to say in the center of this one is Shashank from the Ganges View Hotel in Varanasi holding 
uh, Ursh Tahil's Well, What is Photography? So this is the back of the museum where I think now you get an idea of how the boxes are placed and how the wooden stick can just be taken in and out and you change the images. It's very, very quick. I could change the Museum of Photography every hour. It's, it's, so, it's so quick to do. And the interesting thing is when somebody else does it, it also just, it's fine. It's absolutely fine. And then Museum of Chance went to the Art Institute of Chicago in, sorry, that was 2014. And there we decided to build another story. And so we took out some of the rectangular images and made this little fictional short story on the wall. And of course, the furniture had to be there. And they said, why do you need these tables and stools to come from um, all the way? And I said, you know, they, they are parked, they are part of the museum. I cannot have somebody tell me what I can do with these museums. So because shipping is always the problem, I have made the reserve collection such that it fits into the museum. The furniture, the tables, and the stools all fit inside the museums. Now I want to make beds that will fit over the museums. So it doesn't increase the shipping costs. <laughs> this is Museum Bhavan at the MMK in Frankfurt last year, and this is where it was last seen. And of course, the display changes, and, but the furniture always has to be there, and the benches have to travel with the museums. Um, little ladies' museums, Museum of Machines at the back, and furniture, uh, Museum of Vitrines on the wall. And then I also showed my favorite um, center letter, which is this box, and I really think that uh, I really think this is when work changed for me, when I made this box, which title, I had been making these books for many years for friends that I traveled with, and I would cut up medium format contact sheets and paste them in these accordion failed books and send them to various people uh, that I wanted to write letters to. So these were the letters that I would send to people, and when I wrote one to Steidl after his trip to uh, Calcutta, he said he wanted to publish them, and I had 32 of them, and he said, well, we can't do all 32. We'll do seven for a start. And so this became, I think, my first museum that I could carry with me. It was fine. It was actually quite flattering when it got stolen, or one of the books got <laughs> stolen, and then I put it in a vitrine at, um, at the MMK. But that reminded me that this idea of the single image is also something that had started to really annoy me with photography because I look at my work in contact sheets, medium format contact sheets, 12 images on a piece of paper. I'm used, I use that as a diary. I'm used to reading images like that, but also diagonally, backwards. And I just, I just think it was the museums or the institutions just thought, this is an easier way of showing photography, or somehow they wanted to put photography in a certain place. And that's why we possibly had to show work in these single images with mats, glass, completely deadened on the wall, stuck for two or three months. I was not going to have it that way. So this is sent a letter in the vitrine. And now Museum Bhavan has come back to Vasant Vihar. Um, it has even larger furniture there. And on the 12th of December, it will occupy the Kiran Nadar Museum in Delhi. Singh will be curator in residence for six weeks. I will live or spend every day there for six weeks and salesperson at the Museum Bhavan store. I have great interest in making book objects and book carts and forcing and well, encouraging people to buy <laughs> the book objects as my work. And actually, wonderful um, story was when a group came from the Tate to look at what they might want to acquire. And I said, you know, why do you focus so much on my prints? You should really look at my uh, books. And they said, you know, books are fine, Danita, but what do we do with the books? We either make facsimiles or we put them in vitrines. And I said, to myself, I'm going to show you books that can go on the wall. That's another project. But I'm going to leave you here, actually with that project, and the way I like to handle my museums.
good evening. Um, I have nothing to, to show <laughs> on this screen. Um, it's a bit strange because we are really preparing these next days uh, at it, and we are so busy I couldn't really prepare a lecture. And on, maybe on top of that, I'm not sure uh, Musée de la Danse is, is the right tool to make a lecture. Somehow the, the big thing with Musée de la Danse is about the question mark. What would be a Musée de la Danse? And the, I mean, the best thing in inventing this project and this uh, trying to invent this museum was to, to really discuss, encounter people, uh, and maybe it's you tonight, uh, what would be Musée de la Danse for you? So what would be the Catherine Mood Musée de la Danse? What would be your Museum of Dance? Uh, and, and the lecture form is maybe a little bit strange because I think the, the co-working, co-building, trying to think what is this mental space that could be called Musée de la Danse is maybe more interesting than uh, lecturing about it or just uh, putting, putting up some statements. Or, and, and then on top of that, because we are, we are, we are building this project, uh, I mean, since a few months or, or even uh, after some almost years of discussions, uh, I, I'm, I'm drawn into it, so I'm not, I'm not sure I, I can do really something to, to, I don't know, to participate well in this situation, but uh, I just, uh, as a reaction, I, I remember uh, in one of the projects called Expo Zero, that, and one of the protocol of work that we will present, I will talk briefly about it. Uh, we asked Padimini Chetu, an Indian uh, dancer, uh, if she could participate in Expo Zero and, and what, she would, what could be her uh, Musée de la Danse idea. And she said, but you know, I really hate museums. Uh, in India, after independence, uh, dance has been museified. It killed dance. We built boxes of in the different Indian dance styles, and therefore I cannot participate. And, and we said, but this is really because you, because exactly what you just said is we need you in this project. You please join, and we and we we'll start from there. We'll start. You will be confronted with museum lovers, and you hate museums, but it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a good start. And 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 therefore, Museums is really a a way where I can lecture about it, but basically it's more interesting to, to hear what you have to say. Uh, are you a student, a, a teacher, an artist, and, and what could be your Musée de la Danse? To, how do you relate to this idea? Uh -huh. Nevertheless, the first, the first uh, um, not the first statements, the, the, the preconceptions around Musée de la Danse was that in dance, usually you have two major institutions uh, uh, that are the dance schools and the theaters. Of course, now you could say uh, YouTube is the main institution for the dance, if you think. Uh, it's a major uh, web channel. You can access dance from all over, all over the world, from dance history. You can learn dances. Uh, so you could say YouTube is maybe a major institution nowadays. But let's say if you, if you and I'm, I'm French, if I think about uh, cultural policies and state-funded uh, uh, spaces, that we have the dance schools and we have the theaters. But both spaces, I love both spaces, but they have their own, their own problems. They don't communicate well. And, and if I make it maybe too simple, the, in the dance schools, you, you learn how to, how to practice dance or how to move, how to train, how to become a dancer. And it's really a physical uh, practice you're learning, even though and somehow I would say the books are, are having difficulties to enter the, the usual dance schools, traditional dance schools. And, and in the theaters, it's the, it's the other way around. It's, it's a place where you, you look at dance, so you're sitting, you don't move yourself, and you watch dance. But actually, these two spaces, they are, they are really directed by dancers. Uh, because dance schools, especially in France, I don't know about the UK, but uh, you have rarely a dance school directed by dancers because usually the dance schools are inside the music schools. So actually it's music people who are organizing the dance in the, and in the music schools. So it's a, it's a little department in the music schools. And in the theater, it's the same. It's really theater people, theater as a genre, who are directing theaters, and dancers and choreographers are only guests in these programs. And, and, and it's one of the problems we have with these institutions, how to develop dance inside of that, but also the fact that I thought, and, and together with many, many other artists and, and friends and, and people, that dance was a wider experience, a wider field, a wider scope, a wider uh, mental space than something to, to, to move, to learn, to train, to, to sweat, or something to be watched at. That dance could be re read, dance could be written, dance could be, uh, you could visit dance, you could be visited by dance, and therefore, 
Uh, the theater that starts at 8.30 where you have the show or the dance school that starts at 10, join in and you ha you're in front of the teacher should, should be somehow shaken to, to invent another kind of public space, maybe art public space via and for dance where the experience of dance could cover the field in another way. Uh, you could come back the next day, you, would, you wouldn't... Uh, you would be not a student or a viewer, but you could be a visitor, you could be visited, and, and, uh, and, and therefore you could cover the field from the studio to the dance floor, from, from the stage to the street, and you, it, it was also a way to, to shift some, some very fixed walls that still exist, and maybe existed even more uh, uh, 10 years ago when the, the idea of Musée de la Danse came. That is the wall between history and improvisation, or between visual art and live art, um, and, and maybe between object and people, because there is really a big fight in, 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 in museums between the, the object collection and the people visiting. And I, I remember uh, Nikolaus Hirsch, an architect who participated in one, one of our projects, he, he made a great uh, text actually uh, that is called Object versus People, where, where he states that in the, the best museum should be without any visitors, without any people, because to really keep well the objects, uh, people are bringing humidity, people are, are bringing bacteria, so the best, if you want to really keep the collection safe, you shouldn't have any visitors. Uh, and, Musée de la Danse started from, from this, uh, these problems, these questions, this trying to remove walls. But uh, when, I, when I came to direct uh, Musée de la Danse in, in Rennes, so before it was, it was called the National Choreographic Center of uh, Rennes and Brittany, we named it Musée de la Danse. And we took very seriously this question, even though a lot of people thought it was a joke, or it was a, it was a one-year project, but then we should really move on. And we said, no, no, it's a 200 years project will stay forever, uh, will die inside of that, and we will take very seriously the question of what would be a collection in the field of dance, what would be museology, uh, and we would, we would really um, um, develop it uh, seriously. And um, we had, with a, when I arrived, there was a new space uh, uh, for this center that was, that was called the garage with dance studios. And, and everybody expected, what do we do in this new space? Uh, and, and of course, one of the first things we should have done was to, 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 put, to put up the best exhibition, let's say, to demonstrate that a Musée de Lens was needed. We would have the best videos, the best installations, the best performances, the best, uh, uh, I don't know, foresight installation, the, you know, the best, uh, the best we could have to collect what could prove that Musée de Lens was a good project. And instead of doing that, because we wanted an experimental institution, we wanted to invent an institution to, so to maybe to move from institutional critique to institutional building. Instead of uh, filling the space with good artworks or good projects, we decided to leave it empty to invite 10 people, uh, philosophers, architects, curators, archivists, dancers, theater people, music people, to, to work together for one week to, and asking them what would be the Musée de la Danse, what would be Tim Mitchell's Musée de la Danse, what would be Padminiceto Musée de la Danse, what would be Catherine Wood Musée de la Danse, uh, what would be your Musée de la Danse, and to start from there, so leaving the spaces empty, we called that Expo Zero, and it became our first exhibition where these 10 participants, they exchange a lot, uh, what could this be, uh, not only to build a program, but to really go deep in, in this mental space, and then they would welcome the visitors, and guiding them into, let's say, their visions of what to be. And it could be, uh, an, it was an exhibition, but there was no real artwork, so there was no video, no photos, uh, no music, no theater lights, no costume. Uh, they were just there among the visitors, discussing, lecturing, organizing uh, instant prototypes of what could be the works for Musée de la Danse, and just uh, improvising also what could be this place called Musée de la Danse. And, and this is how it started. And, uh, and somehow it started with this question, and it remains a question. And what we are doing uh, in the next days in Tate is a question, and it's the project is the question. If Tate Modern was Musée de la it's we took very somehow we are doing things, but the question would almost be enough. Uh, in that sense, uh, the, the idea that Tate Modern could be Musée de la Danse, and, and that we could develop from that is almost enough, of, even though we are coming with 
more than 90 people. We are invading the spaces. We, 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 we took Chris Dercon away. We, we made many changes. But uh, somehow it could remain a question. And in the question, you already have the whole project. Um, and and when, when I was uh, listening to, to, to the two lectures, uh, I thought with Musée de la Danse, so we started by asking the question, and we are still going on with that. Uh, and we developed many little artist museums. It was not one. It was not, uh, for example, the Charmatz Musée de la Danse. This was a fear. So, so it became, we asked Tim Mitchell, who's a, uh, I, he's not there tonight. Uh, he will join uh, Expo Zero, actually, uh, in the next days. Uh, and, and we asked him, OK, what would Musée de la Danse? And he, and he, talked, uh, he told us about a project called Photo Museum, where he would ask different artists to send a photography connected to movement and why. And he would exhibit this, uh, these photographies in a very uh, spe specific way. And, and this artwork that is also a museum, or that is an exhibition, and that is, that is a collection uh, of photographies became uh, part of what we did exhibit, part of what he did produce, but it, you could also say this was his Musée de la Danse. So, and, and in many of the projects we did, there was a Jérôme Bell exhibition. Uh, it's called Jérôme Bell in three seconds, 30 seconds, three minutes, 30 minutes, and three hours. And it was also a way to not only exhibit Jérôme Bell's work, but also to organize his collection from we did a, we we organize we produce a photography of Jean-Luc Moulin from one very specific moment of Jérôme Bell's piece. Then 30 seconds, uh, it was a longer uh, experiment, an idea he had he never did. We we tried it. Uh, three minutes was a song from the show Must Go On, one of his pieces that was uh, in, in, on a video. The the 30 minutes was a, uh, um, a piece he did for a Paris Opera dancer in a video, and the three hours was the website he organized to present his own catalog. So somehow this exhibition around Jérôme Bell was also a way to do a Jérôme Bell's museum. And, and in many of the projects, as I said, we, 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 I don't know if we produced, or, but artists came with, with this idea that they would build their own museum or they would build their own dance museum. And there was Xavier Leroy who did retrospective with us. There was also um, Pierre Le Guillon, a visual artist, who organized really with boxes a, a photo museum that you could also unfold. So it, it's somehow a little bit related to, to, to your project. It's called La Grande Evasion. I really like this work. And, and I would also say that a majority of the projects we tried to develop were collaborative with many people. So there would not be one curator, but 10. Uh, and, and we did many co collective protocols for the work. And one that we will present in the, in the next day is called 20 Dancers for the 20th Century. And it comes from this idea that why in dance we do not have so many dance museums is because maybe the main museum space in dance is the body. Uh, may, if you want to reconstruct a Trisha Brown's piece or a Balanchine work, of course, scores, films, uh, texts, uh, pictures are important or even really necessary. But if you have a dancer who did these works, he knows the choreography in his own body. You have the structure. You have So the main archive, even though you have amazing archive centers in, throughout Europe, but the main archive is still the living body that, that can, and that you, you can do archaeology inside this body. So, of course, it's, 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 it's great to hear about your travel, your trip to Africa. But in Musée de la Danse, we, we did travel a lot, but we did a lot of uh, archaeological travel inside our own bodies, or asking the dancers what do they remember, what do they represent, what, what they have inside. And, and 20 dancers for the 20th century that will be in the collection spaces in the next days is really this idea that we don't do a choreographer's museum, but we, we ask each dancer to do some archaeology to, to bring up, to reinvent, to, to bring to life again a collection of solo gestures from the 20th century, but where each dancer do not represent one artwork or one choreographer, because one dancer did a musical called Casimodo. He's a fan of Charlie Chaplin that he learned and he, he loves modern times, but at the same time he worked with Meg Stewart and he's an amazing improviser. So, so the same dancer has his own archive and is representing many different artists or many, many different pieces, many different artworks. Um, maybe one, one, one of the last thing I would like to say is that we, so we started it, we, we are going on with that, and of course we are going on in the next days. Uh, one of the, the main uh, um, 
line of the next year, of the future that we discovered was that uh, we wanted to build an art space that would be a rethinking of what a public space could be, a public space via and for dance. But lately, uh, last week, we did a, a, a huge experiment in, in, uh, in Rennes called Fou de Danse. You cannot translate it really like crazy about dance. Fou de Danse is a strange, uh, strange name where we use a, 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 the largest public square in Rennes and we try to do a 12 hours uh, permanent transformation of dance with, with like a roller coaster of dance experiences from warm up to uh, professional performances to amateur performances from kids trying stuff. Uh, to, uh, to uh, folklore uh, from Brittany, where we are, um, to dance floor. And, and it's also related a little bit with what we are doing here in the Turbine Hall, the third project uh, we are doing in the next days. And this idea of the public space became really more important. I'm pretty sure Musée de la Danse is, is going in this direction. And I think it, co it strangely connects us to Tate, because I, I was discussing with the visitors' assistants this morning. And, and our question is if Tate Modern was Musée de la Danse. But actually, when Tate Modern opened, it was 15 years ago. Uh, I think today is the, uh, it's the anniversary uh, day of, of the opening of, of Tate Modern. I was not, I'm not British. I was not in England, but it was very clear that Tate Modern was not one more museum, was not one more uh, collection display with maybe a better architecture with white spaces, but the, it was more than that. You would have the white cubes, you would have the collection, but you would have something else. You would call it Tate, call it something else. You could, you could call it Turbine Hall, but something that was, it was trying to reinvent what could be the, the museum of the future. And as a dancer, we felt immediately concerned with what this museum could be. And, and this museum uh, did evolve a lot to, to the point that, well, that they are now building the pyramid and, and re, re, uh, reinvesting the, the oil tanks and this kind of thing. So the fact that this museum would be a transformative museum that and was very interesting and intriguing for many dancers where we could feel concerned and not then later by the program designed here, or, but really also by the fact that a museum was opening, but it was not a better museum, it was a new kind of museum. And, and there, was, there was very clearly, and there is clearly a play between what is a public space and what is an art space. Because this turbine hall, because it's free also, you could come here for the Sonia Delaunay exhibition, but you could just come here to have a picnic on the slope, you could come here to roll the slope. So, so somehow, when you can say, it's, is it negative, is it positive? I don't know, but clearly, uh, Tate is as well an art center, a museum space, and a public space that you can experience. And, and Musée de la Danse has, has a strong interest in what could be a public space that would be an art space, but that would be also a dance space. And, the, and I, I think the public space nowadays is full of fears. And I'm, not, I'm sure it's not only in France. We, we have all the, the terrorist attacks that, are, that make everybody suspicious about everything. The, we have much many more armed soldiers in the streets of France than we have unarmed dancers in the streets of France. Uh, I, I don't know about the UK, but I'm pretty sure we, we, are, we are sharing a lot of issues. And, and the streets are full of fears, uh, which neighborhood uh, can you enter or not, which uh, uh, the groups of population, where are the, the, the awful immigrants uh, endangering our, our bodies, our movements, our identities. So somehow the, the public space has become a major, if not a problem, but something that we need to, to rethink, to reinvest, to, 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 yeah, to, to, to move again. And I think dance and the museum has, has a, a nice relation where museum is trying to reinvent itself via dance, and dance, of course, is reinventing itself via the museum. But maybe what we are doing together between the museum and the dance is maybe more ultimately to try to rethink what is a public space and how, what, what kind of permeability do we organize between the bodies, well, how, how movement can, be, can, can, can let us rethink what is this public space, what can we, what can we allow ourselves to do, what can we share, how can we uh, build a, a new kind of community, a diverse community, but also how can we organize the confrontations uh, in the public space so that public space is not only a neutral, clean, a uh, nice space, but it's also a place where you can, you can express and, and, I don't know, be confronted with others. And, and I think this is the future of Musée de la Danse somehow. And, and this is why we are at Tate, because Tate is both a museum space and maybe really first a public space.
Voilà. Ça va Ok, thanks. So, uh, thank you very much for your presentations. Um, we're going to speak now for about 20, 25 minutes. But if you, anybody in the audience has a burning desire to intervene, please raise your hand. And we will include you in the conversation. But just please wait for the microphone to come to you because we're recording, we're filming the conversation tonight. Um, <clears throat> so I just wanted to start off by thinking about two things. One thing is, I, that comes across very clearly for me in the discussion was this question of self-institutionalizing, that, that I think all of you are somehow involved in in different ways. Um, so Boris, it seemed to me that there was a sort of invitation for people to produce themselves as a museum. So the Museum of Jerome Bell, a kind of <clears throat> democratic gesture in a way. Um, and with Simon, the, maybe there was some kind of smuggling of the self going on in that project um, that we can touch on later. Um, and Dianita, you're obviously very clearly a strong director of your museum. Um, but <laughs> and the question of autonomy ca ca came out loud and clear, I think, in your presentation. Um, <clears throat> but one thing, the, the other thing I wanted to uh, talk about was audiences, this kind of interaction with the public. And um, in an anecdote that I read about your, these museums, um, it talked about how you decided to represent yourself at the Indian Art Fair. And you decided to take one of your museums to a booth at the Indian Art Fair. Um, and my experience of that, that situation is it's kind of an incredibly um, hectic and um, very popular um, event. So you have, of course, all the art world that turn up, but then you also have the general public that come in kind of huge numbers, and then sometimes it's their first experience of contemporary art, I think. And so I'm wondering, how was that experience for you? You know, how was the experience of, I mean, when you showed your, your images, it looked like this kind of very nice choreography in the kind of white cube, and maybe you would come in every day and move things around. And I wonder what the reality of a kind of extremely hectic um, art fair scenario was like in terms of this mediation process with, with the general public. Yeah, I, I didn't speak about the art fair really, but it was, it's, it was a great place for me. Yeah. I've been there for three years now, and every year I go there with something completely different that yeah. nobody is prepared for, and people are confused at first, but after three years there were people fighting with me because they couldn't have my book objects. So success. The first year success. they were laughing yeah. because I had a card. Yeah. And I said, you should buy these books because yeah. each one has their own cover. And it's my work. They said, oh, come on, we want your prints. And I said, stop it, stop it, buy the books. Yeah. But so people laughed. The second year I took the book museum, the file room book museum, and I went and I moved it. And people actually stood there and watched. I used to do that twice a day, and I called it a performance, but I also wanted to show that, you know, you can touch all this, and you can yeah. come closer, and you can move things, that art doesn't have to be stuck to wherever some curator put it. Yeah. And this year, when I presented the Museum of Chance book object in an edition of 88, we were completely sold out, with people fighting with me because I sold theirs to somebody else. It was complete success. <laughs> what I would have expected from a contemporary museum in India yeah. or a gallery space actually happened at the art fair. This, this is one of the kind of paradoxical facts, isn't it? Because maybe we go on to speak about yeah. the museums in India later. Mm -hmm. um, but Simon, I was thinking, who is the audience for your museum of incest? That's one question. And the other question is for me, the, the museum of incest, it's kind of almost like beyond the querying of the museum, you know? It's a, it's a kind of uh, move into what might be considered to be very inappropriate museum material. But I also felt, when I watched your presentation, that the, the question of the museum was a sort of Trojan horse in one sense, but also incest felt like a little bit of a red herring. And then actually it was a little bit more about you and about your biography and some kind of conversation with your father, perhaps. And I wonder whether he is the audience in this. In this I mean, the thing that really struck me from all three presentations somehow, and maybe less obviously with, 
with mine in the way it was presented, but was this idea of pragmatism, that somehow when you're making an, an, an artwork and you know the circumstances in the gallery and things, you're dealing mainly with the idea of it and maybe somehow, if it's more conceptual, with the distribution of it or how it's shown or sold or whatever. Yeah. Um, but, when, but with the three of us, the thing I think kind of shone through was this idea that we're dealing somehow with, with reality and you, as, when you talk about shipping the works or you know, uh, you know, coming down to the nuts and bolts of it, or you, when you talk perhaps more about public space and politics. And, and for me, you know, this, this work came out of um, certain pragmatic um, personal um, questions Firstly, that I'd come out of, uh, of studying architecture, and this is the first work I'd ever made as, as an artist in art school. Yeah. It's seven years old, and, and, um, and it was so much about uh, encountering the art world as, as having studied architecture. And I studied architecture because I was interested in it, but never because I wanted to be an architect, and I always knew I wanted to study art. And arriving at uh, art school, there was a great snobbery around it. It was like, well, you know, now the architect's doing art. So... And everything I did was seen through that lens. And I realized that somehow this identity would never leave you unless there's a kind of purist idea, of course, about being an artist. And so I said, well, if everyone thinks I'm an architect, I'm going to make architecture, I'm going to make a building, and it's going to be so over-personal and over-sharing and kind of so ridic ridiculously architectural um, that, it, that it will... That, and, and it was through doing that, actually, that my colleagues and around me accepted me as, as an artist. Um, and also dealing with, um, whether this is pragmatic or not, but um, of how, how, how do you deal with a Western education? How do you deal with all the information you're given and the, and the knowledge and, and the amount, of course, in my generation of material information that you're, that you're confronted with all the time? And is there any way of making sense of it or a narrative or not? And I remember... Um, in architecture school, the whole point of, of architecture is, is creating these fictive narratives all the time around, you know, grown, intelligent adults talking about, you know, this and explaining why this will regenerate Hackney and bring, you know, X, Y and Z, you know, and, and there was something very beautiful and poetic about the fact that it existed in this um, ephemeral realm. Um, but it was all in the imagination, but also something rid ridiculous when you start to make architecture, which is when it starts to intersect with economy and politics, and you're then justifying things on different level. And so it was, in a way, the, the, the idea that for me, as, as, a, as a student, as the first artwork I've ever made, it was about you know, dealing pragmatically with everything that I had contained within me and experience, but also trying to figure out how I could also become an artist, in a sense. But you said some somewhere that actually this was the point at which the students, your, your colleagues in, in the Stelerschule, who up until that point hadn't accepted you, this kind of, this work legitimated you. Um, and why was that? Was that because, it wasn't because of the museum structure, obviously, it was because of perhaps the boldness of the statement or the... I think it's, I mean, I, d I don't know, I think it's because it was, it was a formed, you know, a formed idea and, so it, and it, was a for, it was a form proposition and maybe the way I, you know, I hadn't changed, obviously, you don't change yeah. overnight, but those are all things I've been interested in and maybe working in a fragmented way with, but this just suddenly gave it a form and it was a, a performance and, um, and, and the performance as lecture was something that was, at that moment, 2005, right. uh, no, 2006, seven, yeah, yeah. It was yeah. a kind of new form and it was very exciting and... Um, and, and this kind of dematerialization of art was kind of in full swing at that moment, and I think that, um, that might have contributed to it. Yeah. And, and Boris, you, one thing that you said, I think, in an interview was that um, one of the democratic elements of your museum was that, you know, it was a collection that people could actually take away. So you could attend a workshop and you could learn a gesture and that was a part of the collection that was sort of removable from yeah, the it, museum. Yeah, it was because it's, it was striking how things change while doing Musée de la Danse. We, we had a work that was uh, created before Musée de la Danse existed that, that is called Flipbook or Roman Photo and, and, and we staged a version uh, this weekend where we, we work from a book uh, by David Vaughan, the archivist of the Merce Cunningham Company and the book is called 50 Years of Dance. And there's uh, more than 300 pictures in the book. We learn all the pictures by heart, or let's say by body, and we per perform them like a flip book. 
with a, like from, from beginning to end, front page to last page. And, and uh, when we started Musée de la Danse in Rennes, one of the first projects on the side of Expo Zero was to, to do this Roman photo. So we, uh, we, we worked with non-dancers. We made an open call to people who never danced, but maybe wanted to dance. And, and it's as if we locked them in our museum during 10 days so that they would learn this, let's say, artwork, that is this archive of Cunningham. They would perform it. And when they would get back home, it was clear that we didn't have any more, like Musée de la Danse didn't have the Roman photo anymore because the performers were home. So we, we just had the book that we bought, uh, 50 euros, but we didn't have Roman photo. We didn't have the performance. They had it somehow. They came back home uh, knowing what, uh, like the shapes of Cunningham, knowing these pictures, knowing, uh, knowing who they, what they were, knowing, having learned also who is John Cage, who is, who is Andy Warhol there, and, and what they were doing. And, and the idea that it was, a, it, it was yeah, like a, something they could bring back. And maybe it's true from, from any painting. I mean, you, you're watching a Manet or a Monet. You, you experience it, and you, you also bring it back home. Not only that you, you're using the, I don't know, the iPad, uh, how do you call this, the, the stick, uh, st you know, no. Anyway, you, you, are, you are imprinting it for yourself. And bring, but with dance, it's very obvious that the artwork is being disseminated, or the one we created, at least was being disseminated among visitors that would become the artwork themselves and they would, they would dismantle it and bring them in their own families or homes. Or, and, and I find it striking or interesting to, to, to work with this idea that in dance, the artworks are, you ne you're never sure where, where it starts, where it ends, who, uh, which artwork belongs to who, and, and with the dancer choreographer's question, like a dancer may have worked 20 years for the choreographer, may have given all, all the movements of the choreographies, still the author is supposedly only the choreographer, so the, the dancer is not even allowed to perform it unless he has the right. So, so, so it's, and, and Shelley Center, she's part of Exposio, she, she said, okay, we don't own the rights, but at least we own the experience of, of it. We, so we own our, our own experience. And, but it's really uh, legal and, and, and personal and artistic and aesthetical issues about wh whose work is this. And in dance, it's, I think it's pretty interesting. In painting, it's the same. Huh? You have an atelier of Rubens. You're not really sure what Rubens did in this painting uh, by the atelier. You, you, you're not sure. But in dance, it's really obvious that it's collaborative work. Then you do a gesture, you think it's yours, but actually you did it way before. You know, you're never sure who invented it, who, who did transmit it to you. So, so in Musée de la Danse, this idea became a, a, a ground, let's say, to develop works. But what's interesting is that it's obviously very, you're very, in terms of establishing a museum of dance, you're very interested in art and this relationship to art. And you kind of bring in, on the one hand, you bring in artists to be part of your, your conversation, but I guess also architects like Nicholas Hirsch, yeah. you mentioned. I mean, but on the other hand, you're kind of now coming to take yeah. modern and you're sort of, in a way, introducing something back to the art circuit. It's, it's a little bit like what Simon said. He, he had to, I mean, I don't want to misquote you, but you, had to, you, were, you were considered an architect, but when you did an architecture, you, you became considered really as an artist, as a proper artist. And, but for, for, for dance and Musée de it was the same, I would say, because Musée de Lance didn't start by thinking, oh, what could we do at MoMA? What could we do at Tate? What could, how could we fit the white cubes? How could we fit the exhibition uh, formats? How could we fit the collection? Yeah. Uh, which was maybe the start of uh, Tino Segal's work, for example. We started yeah. by saying, okay, we, we stop answering to, in, to the invitations and thinking, what can I do in this opening? What can I do in this vernissage? What can I do in this? But, but think, okay, we are building our own museum. It's a museum for dance. Uh, dancing museum, what would it be? What is, what is the frame? What is the collection? What is the economy? What is the, the heritage? Uh, how do we experience it? Or how, how, where, where does it happen? Is it uh, virtual, mental, concrete? Is it physical? Is it immaterial? So, so to really set ourselves our own rules. So somehow we built it in opposition to what you could say the art world or the art history. You, we, 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 it was, but somehow, because we were thinking what could be a collection in the field of that, what could be a museology, then, we, we, then the art world maybe got interested because they, the, the, the museums were, or some of the museums at least, are trying to move from an art-based collection to a, an ideas collection or an, a museum for ideas, a museum for movement, a museum for performance, and how to, how to shape that, how to, 
how, how to deal with these archives or this absence of archives sometimes. And, and we were like a little think tank, very small, of course, a baby museum, a newborn, but nevertheless a think tank that, that we were dealing with these questions. So at the end, we, it's as if Musée de Lens, we started by, it was in opposition to such museums as state, yeah. and it's not the end, I hope, but somehow <laughs> it seems at least we are here. But we are not here as being guests in Tate Modern, we are crossing Tate and we're invading Tate, and, and people think it's only for two days, but actually dancers will tie them up to the pillars and they will never <laughs> escape. And, and, and you think it's only for two days, but actually it's a... Uh, it's but I think that this comes across in all of your presentations. I mean, there's a, there's a kind of this duality of, of this uh, attraction to the museum and also a kind of questioning. Um, and I was also thinking, Simon, of the project that you made in uh, Tate St. Ives, which was a kind of, a kind of biographical um, return to having grown up in St. Ives and the importance of you know, experiencing a particular painting at a certain age and how that, in a way, fed into, I guess, what then went on to become an artistic practice. Um, and also with you, uh, Dainita, it's, um, you sense much more strongly a kind of frustration with museums, particularly museums in, in India. Um, I don't know whether, Simon, you want to just talk a little bit about that project and how that sort of relates to your thoughts about museums. Well, it was a strange situation because um, after making the Museum of Incest, which is as I said, the first work I made, I made um, a second piece which was about um, seeing for the first time a piece of um, modern art, which is Patrick Heron's horizontal stripe painting. It's um, the one that you see in IKEA catalogues or um, quite a lot in the background in porn films, weirdly, um, but apparently. Um, and um, it's kind of got, it's red and orange and it looks like a sunset. And, um, and I just, and I remember this, and, and I remember seeing this because it was the first piece in the Tate St. Ives, which was a fishing village that I grew up in, um, that has a very kind of important British art history. And they decided, Tate decided to build an amazing big museum in this tiny town. And, um, and, you know, I followed the whole kind of story as a child of people coming to the door and saying, can you sign this petition against the Tate? because we want to have a leisure centre with the slide and who is the Tate anyway and of course it went ahead and then I saw and of course you go in and it was this maybe it was a million pounds then or something which is a shocking amount um, and then there was this stripy painting in it and everyone of course says my kid could have done this and blah 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 they're the kind of regular things you hear but now going back um, to, to see what had happened to the hometown that I grew up in from the Tate and being in a way part of that gentrifying um, tribe in a way by contributing my own work to museums that you know um, and seeing how it completely changed changed the town um, and seeing you know fish and chips not being on a plate like this but kind of stacked with <laughs> mint pea sauce and um, not only that but property that change all of these things um, and going as and 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 having been kind of commissioned to do a whole museum exhibition after just th making that second work actually was a, a weirdly perverse challenge because in a way it was setting myself up as making a retrospective um, in a not a huge but a sort of eight museum room but actually on my home turf so the Tate didn't feel like the Tate it felt like the local you know sports hall or the local shop um, and so and the way in which I was able to work with that was working with the local histories but as a as a local as well so it kind of gave me this passport to be allowed to say certain things, and you can probably tell with the Museum of Incest that I quite like to find ways of saying unsayable things. You know, is there a way that you can say totally politically incorrect things by framing it in a certain language or by adding um, a philanthropical or economically viable you know, addition to it? And, um, and this is very much the spirit, I think, of our, of our age, and that's something that interests me a lot. Um, also, not to jump too much forward, but with the Hayward exhibition that I did, was to try to capture this idea that today things, um, in very exciting and interesting ways, of, uh, that, that um, for example, Boris is working with, are never the thing, never the thing on their own. It's not just a museum anymore. A company is not a company, but it's also a charity, and it's also blah 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 blah, and that you know, that companies or museums have found ways to try to be a little bit of everything. We're tonight sponsored by BMW, you know, but we're allowed to say whatever we want, and um, as long as it's not against BMW, which I love. 
Um, oh God, what am I, where am I going with this? Um, um, but just just to try to but that idea of, of of today things being so multifaceted and and impossible to penetrate and, and nebulous in a way so that um, and and with with the project like the Museum of Incest it was exactly about trying to capture something that is is it totally sick is it actually is it not as sick as us being in a BMW talk tonight is that wrong what you know what is political correctness and and it was just trying to find a way of formalizing that without doing what very valiantly and interestingly was done in institutional critique 10 years before me but trying to find a way to capture it without making definitions which I felt was more contemporary somehow yeah. well I think it's this question of social context and you know Dainito we uh, Gita Kapoor talked about your museum project in terms of citizenship, which you didn't like as a, as a term. She hasn't but... seen them. Okay. <laughs> well, she talked about them by repute as being, in a way, your engagement with, with the public and this idea of popularising the museum form as a kind of way of being a citizen. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's also in relation to a kind of critique of museum practice in India or a kind of institutional lethargy or something. That On one hand, there's the institutional lethargy, of course, uh, you know, which, is, which is terrible, and it's only getting worse now with, with the way things are now politically in India. But on the other hand, I think India is a great place to make museums because yeah. we just seem to have a natural propensity for museums. Yeah. People make museums of whatever they like. There's no art historian to tell them whether it's worthy of being a museum or not. Yeah. So a butterfly collector turns his drawing room into a museum, you have a ticket, you have a catalogue, you come in, you look at his butterflies catalogued and you leave. Yeah. So I have my museum bhavan. When somebody dies, you put their photograph on that bed and you put their sandals there and it becomes a shrine and becomes a museum. We have a wide range of museums. It's just, it comes quite naturally. And in a way, I think it's quite nice. The, st the stage I like to photograph is before the curator comes in. Hmm. You know, where you just have the keeper <laughs> of the museum. Yeah. Where in Kamraj's museum in Chennai, just what was not stolen is in the museum. His pressure cooker, <laughs> shaving brush, last suitcase he packed, last newspaper he read. It's very moving, the idea of museums. Um, MGR's museum with his ambassador car still parked there, his pet lion, Raja. It's a different idea of museums, and perhaps... Perhaps that's what we need to think about in India. Mm. We don't have to follow a colonial model of museums, yeah. but allow more for these homegrown museums, which are there anyway, actually. It's not allow. Yeah, but it seems to me that so it's Indian museums are waiting. actually extremely popular, though. When you go to those museums, there are always hundreds of people You know, the most them. popular museum in India is Indira Gandhi's house, where okay. people like to go and see her blood-soaked sari. Right. 10,000 visitors a day. Yeah. National Gallery of Modern Art, 200 visitors a day. So that's the kind of yeah, range. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These memorial museums mm. have a great... Uh, Great footfalls. So you're picking up on something which is already there in, yes, in it's a museum popular culture in India yeah. and importing it yes. into the art context exactly. where you only have 250 yeah. people showing yes, up. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's a form. It's a form that I hope other people will also pick up on. Yeah. It's there all around us. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if anybody has any questions from the audience they want to ask, or indeed if any of you want to ask each other questions at this point. It's, sorry, it's not, it's not a fully formed question, uh, but it was for Boris uh, and your question of the collection and thinking about museology of Musée de la Danse. And I was just really interested in the, not the tension, but that interesting concept of when you're saying the memory was the archive in a way, like the body memory was the archive of dance and that uh, picture books couldn't totally capture what dance is. I was trying to figure out what a collection of Musée de la Danse could be. Could it only be in the event or... I don't know, I'm just interested in that. I mean, we, we, we are small, and we don't have an acquisition budget. Uh, but after six years, we exist in, We do have a collection. Then some, some, we, we consider our protocols are part of the collection. Let's say Expo Zero is part of our collection. It's a protocol of work, or it's a, 
it's an exhibition format or it's this kind of thing. But we also have, let's say, traditional artworks, like I was mentioning Pierre Le Guillon's uh, La Grande Evasion. It's really, he bought 400 different pictures on the web, more or less related to dance. He organized them, he did like a, uh, uh, many boxes, aluminum uh, boxes that can be, you can see them on a sticker, on a flicker, you can, it exists as a performance where you unfold the boxes and you, you can also see it as a diorama. So uh, like for, for uh, museums um, yeah, where you would present dead animals, you use light to make as if they are alive. And he built such a thing with his dance pictures, with uh, some, some light work so that the dancers or the bodies seem to be uh, animated. So let's say this artwork belongs really <laughs> to Musée de la Danse, and it's, it's uh, as, uh, uh, as uh, concrete as many of the artworks in, in an any normal museums, but we have a wide range, and we have also a lot of, of artworks that have been deposited. So we don't own them, but they are part of Musée de la Danse just because the artist uh, said, yeah, okay, you, it, can, it may be part of your collection, but if, if, if Musée de la Danse, they, don't, they disagree, they will take it uh, again. So, so, but we do have a collection. So from, you could say, uh, films, installations, um, it's, it's still very limited, but let's say we have maybe 30, uh, 30 artworks or groups of artworks, including maybe Jean-Luc Moulin photographies that we produce together. Um, what could I mention? Uh, we also, some of works by, uh, from CNAP, Le CNAP, the National Center for Visual Art, deposited some works for us. So, Kiss by Tino Segal, um, an Ernut Mick film, film. So, we, we do have a collection, but but it's not our, let's say, our main uh, focus of attention. We do hope that along the way we, we do things, we produce things, and we hope that some of the things we produce are, uh, are with us a little bit more than, than it would be in a theater. I'm very interested in uh, the terminology. You're using the term museum but your creators at the same time. And I wonder how important the critique of the term museum is to you and how you feel that things will live on after you. Should museums be uh, long-lasting institutions or are they temporarily finite? I feel like you're going to have a really good answer yes. for this. <laughs> <Me too. laughs> we, we elect you to answer. I think, I think it's both. Because now if you say, I'm going to decide what the museum is, I might decide to make a beautiful museum, and we set it on fire at the end of this talk, and it's finished. Or I might decide, I think for me personally, um, when the museums, when my museums go into the collection of an institution, then there's that archive is going into that collection. And I do hope that that museum lives on, but preferably on its own terms, which is always the problem, which is the handling of it, and can everyone rearrange it, and can I keep adding to it? So I think my concerns are a little more different. It's not just that they'll be there forever, but I want to keep adding to them. That becomes the problem, mm. which I'm sure is not. For you, it would be something quite complete, and you could place it somewhere and hope that it would remain. It, in terms of the works that I make, yeah. these finished works. Yeah, I mean, it's. The museums that you make. Yeah, I mean, I think, what we're, in a way, what we're all talking about as well is memory, in, in a way, perhaps more so than even museums. It's maybe how are we dealing with how, what do we think about how things are remembered and how they're presented? Yeah. And how do we think we should, what track should we set, you know, the future generations on, on thinking about memory? And mm -hmm. I think we're all dealing with this um, idea at the moment, of course, that um, what was once an authoritative memory told through governments, museums, banks, blah, 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 is no longer has any authority, of course. Um, and, and we're trying to also understand 
you know, if the internet is itself an authority, if, if democracy is, works, or if there's a better model we're waiting for, you know, and, there, and I think it's, you know, I feel like the thing that may, may be communicating on is a question rather than, 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 yeah. than, a, than, a, than, a, than an idea really even of a building or of, of, of collections even, you know, if I think that even the material is not so interesting as much as, as, as at least trying to capture the spirit of a time and maybe in more um, concrete ways or um, in more personal ways or in maybe more um, um, theoretical ways, um, trying to set a path uh, or a series of pathways for the future that are possibilities um, that might be more concretized by others, I don't know. Do you, did we answer your question? <laughs> Almost. <laughs> What I think, about the word museum? Yeah. It's, hard, you, you, it's easy to find people who say, that what you're doing is not a museum. This is easy. But to find people who say, a museum is this or that, this is very hard. Because it's, uh, what is a museum? Uh, it's, it's pretty open. And, and what, what Le Louvre, you think, everybody knows what Le Louvre is. But actually, uh, not only inside your work, like, what is Le Louvre? It has moved so much. Uh, what is Le Louvre? Now there's Le Louvre Abu Dhabi. <coughs> now there's films in, f like, uh, Tsai Ming Liang filming things inside the loop. It becomes part of the loop, but it's a film by Tsai Ming Liang. So where, is le, where, where does it start? Where does it end? Where, what is really Le Louvre? It has moved a lot. Uh, and, and, and I remember when we started Musée de la Danse, uh, somebody gave me this Greek definition of the word museum. The word museum. It's, a, in English, I'm not sure, a temple to welcome the muses. This is a musée. Like, and I thought our oh, dance definitely can have something to do with that. You know, uh, because a lot of people would say you cannot do a, a museum with dance. Like it's just a, it's a joke. It's a bad joke. Or dance will die also. And so, the the words are very powerful. But but the definition definitions of the words are are nevertheless open to subjectivities. And and and, and I think in 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 France, I don't know now, but you had one hundred. Uh, uh, wooden clock, les sabots, wooden, uh, you know, the wooden shoes, clocks. museums, wooden clocks, museums in France, but you don't, ha you didn't have a slavery museum. Uh, so you could say, <coughs> where is the museum? What, what is the museum we need? Uh, where does it? It's uh, still, I think, the questions of museology, the questions of history, the questions of collection, the questions of sharing with people, the questions of I, th I think are are core. Um, are essential, uh, let's say, uh, tools to think the museum. You know, but you but it's not just an open word. Sorry, you talked about heritage. You, know, you used the word heritage. So mm -hmm. what does that mean for you exactly? I mean, in, in, for me, heritage has a very particular connotation. Yeah. But I assume yeah. that you mean it in a slightly I, I'm not sure. Sense. In French, I use the word patrimoine. But it's not patrimony, if I'm not wrong. It's heritage. I would never use heri heritage in, this. <laughs> in French. Okay. But I, I, yeah. I was told... Patrimoine, you could translate it by heritage. Le patrimoine, I guess, is the heritage. <laughs> so the, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not completely sure. But in dance, le patrimoine, so the, it's us, for sure. Le, it's not the films, uh, you know, like Isadora Duncan, there is hardly a, a film about her, though, though she's so important. She's one of the pioneers of modern dance. She's so important, but you can hardly find a film. So where is the heritage? The heritage in all the people who are next, nowadays still researching on, on her ideas, her text, her, and the heritage in, is inside the bodies of these people who are trying. Yeah. Uh, so, so it's something we say, no, and even before we say, patrimoine c'est nous, in, in dance, and maybe it's true in, in any part of society, like democracy is us, it's not just yeah. a set of rules that is outside of us. It's, we it's have about to, democratizing to, that, the yeah, term yeah, heritage, yeah, yeah, and giving it yeah, other kinds yeah, of uh, yeah, archives. Yeah. Yeah. And, and very often in dance also you, you are confronted with people who say, oh, I'm not a dancer, or I'm not familiar with dance, or I'm, I, I'm, I don't know how to dance. Or, it's, uh, you know, so so to, to, to just say, no, but okay, you're dancing in your shower, but that's already good. Or you're, you did eight years karate, for sure you're a mover. Or you know, to just... <laughs> To just, uh, you, you studied 10 days this book of Merskingham, you become part of the Merskingham Dance Company, the amateur one, or the provisory one, or the temporary one, but still. So, so the, to, to try to open up, and, yeah. and to, so, so that the heritage is, is, is something you can, 
you can yeah share, transform, and that could also transform yourself. Yeah. Do we have I think one question here? Uh, my question is for Danita. Uh, going back to what he was saying, um, sort of relating to it, to the future of the museum and expansion, uh, could Museum Bevan have its own architectural form that would open and expand like the current form? And how would that interact with planning regulations? And hence, how would it react to having additional staff and expanding beyond oh, museum just... Of, museum Bhavan already has its structure. It's my apartment. I'm moving <laughs> upstairs. My kitchen is the reception desk. To the right as you enter is my gift shop. How can you have a museum without the gift shop? And on the left are the photos I showed you. That is Museum Bhavan. And I hope very much I'll be able to leave it like that. And the Archivist in Residence program with a terrace outside for parties that can be rented for small weddings, I suppose. <laughs> I'm also the marketing director of Museum Bhavan. <laughs> I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. I don't know if anybody wants to ask the final question of the evening. Yeah. yeah. So I think um, maybe we'll finish there. So thank you very much for your presentations. Thank you. It's a pleasure. <laughs> And Friday and Saturday, Friday and Saturday are the days when you can experience the Musée de la Danse at Tate Modern. Yeah. <laughs>